I can't explain to you how dumb and simultaneously amazing this movie is, but I'm going to do my best. <laughs> Birdemic is a feature film written by James Newen in 2010. It had an estimated $10,000 budget, which was mostly funded by Newen's day job. And because of this, it was filmed mostly on weekends over the course of seven months and took four years to complete. I had no idea what to expect going into this movie. And we start off with four minutes of opening credits. And apparently Newen wasn't able to hire a full crew. So half of them are made up anyway. I don't know why we need opening credits if none of the names are real. <laughs> The movie follows Rod, who is our protagonist, and I think this Google review describes him best. Rod is a literal block of wood. <laughs> That's it. He has no other qualities. <laughs> we first meet Rod as he crosses the road, and he walks like he's trying to do a laxative challenge. He goes into a diner to have breakfast, and we are gifted with our first bit of dialogue, and it is just <laughs> the best way to set your expectations. Oh my god, the footsteps kill me. <laughs> Menu. And Rod suddenly lays eyes on the love interest, Natalie. You can really feel the chemistry between these two characters as Rod spends the next two minutes staring at her with zero self-awareness. She leaves and then he runs after her, but is also casually slow walking. I don't mean to bother you. What? What? He gets her number and they part ways. We get a sequence of events showing us Rod's daily activities, including, but not limited to, eating breakfast, watching the news, driving to work, getting gas, driving to work again, walking into work, and also taking a phone call. What I just described to you in about eight seconds was delivered to us in a five minute sequence. And while this is meant to tell us that Rod is a really hardworking, dedicated salesman, it actually just tells us that Rod is the most boring person to ever person. I just want to point out as well, the news clip had me rolling. Why is she so small? Meanwhile, Natalie gets a phone call from her very real, totally legit modeling agency, Dream Models, that she has been booked for Victoria's Secret. The movie has a really impressive way of extending clips past when they were supposed to end, whilst also simultaneously cutting characters off mid-sentence. Like this phone call that should have ended here. Congratulations again. Okay, I'll talk to you soon. Okay, bye. But instead we got this. Congratulations again. Okay, I'll talk to you soon. Okay. All right. No. Okay, I'll talk to you later. Thank you again. All right. Okay, bye, Christine. Thanks. Okay. Rod calls Natalie to set up a date, and then we're back at home watching the news. There's a knock at the door, and it's a salesman for solar panels here to sign paperwork. Hi, my name is Jerry Owens. I'm from Solar Power Accessories. Uh, we have an appointment today. Is that estimate I was telling you about? Wow, $20,000 for a three kilowatt solar panel? Yes. Wow, sell it, Jerry. Now tell him, Jerry, where are you going to put it? And that's where we're going to install your solar panel. Sorry, you're asking what that scene was for? Next question. Natalie and Rod are on their first date, and Natalie asks what Rod does for a living. I like sales. It fits my personality. Started out as a software engineer. BS computer science. Software development was boring for me, and I felt that I was more of a sales and marketing type. So, I switched to a high-tech sales career. If you ever have to go, oh, leave, get out. After their date, Natalie calls Mike, who just happens to be Rod's best friend's girlfriend. There are two love-making scenes in this movie, but don't worry. Both times the actresses are wearing bikinis because the director didn't actually want them to get with the actors. No, no, no. I did not have sexual relations with that woman. <laughs> Sorry, you're asking why I imagine Peace is printed out on a piece of paper and stuck on the wall of their bedroom and why in every other scene Maya's in she's wearing a shirt that says imaginepeace.com? Don't ask questions I don't have answers for. They set up a double date and we are delivered the best scene in cinematic history. Shh, it's starting. I have some great news. Our board of directors has agreed to the acquisition of NCT Software by Oracle Corporation for a billion dollars. Brilliant. You guys, 
You guys have worked hard and you've all earned your stock option. Congratulations. <laughs> So, now you get a big payday with a big stock option, huh? Yeah, I earned it. All those big deals I did with NCT and millions of dollars of revenues and sales. Who put that there? When are you gonna grow up, man? Chicks love cars. If you wanna get into their pants, you better have a nice, hot Ferrari. She's my hot Ferrari. What? Besides, I love my Mustang, which is a plug-in hybrid. Rod and Natalie go on more dates, one of which is the Half Moon Bay Art and Pumpkin Festival, which yes, is a real thing, and no, they did not have permits to film there. Which is so bonkers to me, because they just showed up and started filming and hoped for the best. And they chose this piece of art that they didn't know was going to be there, and they focus on it like it's a core piece of the story. Oh, lovers on the moon. Yeah. And then they just film this guy that's just trying to do his actual job in carving a pumpkin. Where was his credit in the opening titles? I fixed it. We then get a five minute sequence of them dancing in an empty restaurant because we have to tick all of the movie stereotypes. <laughs> they go back to a motel, not one of their houses, and uh, get it on. But don't worry, she's wearing a bikini. For free? Um, hello, editing Maddie here. I just noticed how dirty her feet are. Holy sh! The next day. Yes, those are birds dive bombing and blowing up like London in the 1940s, paired with literal plane noises in the most stunning display of CGI I've ever seen. Natalie and Rod make a mad dash to a neighboring motel room where they meet Ramsey and Becky. They head to Ramsey's van armed with wire coat hangers and jump scare warning. This is the most tense and realistic fight scene you're ever going to witness. They drive away and come across some cars pulled over on the side of the road that contain people that have been attacked by the birds. Ramsey just happens to have several firearms in his car. I can't help but wonder what the people driving past people that aren't involved in the film are thinking when they're seeing two grown men waving guns about. <laughs> they find a little girl under one of the cars and a boy inside of the trunk of another and they adopt them as their own. I've isolated three separate incidents where a bird is hit just for your entertainment. You're welcome. Natalie patches up the kid's wounds. Thank you. Say it like you mean it. Thanks. Thank you. The kids say they're hungry, so they pull over to an abandoned convenience store and steal some food. They go to a picnic spot and find an old troll man on a bridge. Hey, stand back! Rod and Natalie literally don't acknowledge his warning at all and continue walking towards him very creepily. Honestly, if I told strangers to go away and they continued approaching me like this, I would think I was about to get murdered. <laughs> hey, I thought I told you to stand back. These birds are contaminated. They have bird flu virus. Now go away. Uh, can we just talk about it at, at the picnic area? You want to talk? Okay, all right. Well, that was easy. Turns out he's an orthologist. Then why are they attacking us? I don't know. Ah. Basically, he blames global warming for the reason that all birds are suddenly explosive, spit acid, and sound like planes. The next line of dialogue was written in at the last minute because the actress playing Becky had to leave production to go to acting school. Well, somebody had to. So we are blessed with this line. Where's Becky? She's taking a shit. I'm having a hard time not believing that the director was so annoyed that someone left the movie that he just wrote in the most embarrassing death scene possible.
She literally dies taking a shit and then falls back into said shit. And I'm gonna claim full ignorance here. I know nothing about guns, but I do know that you shouldn't simultaneously wave them in your face and also your friend's face, especially when distressed like Natalie is here. Ramsey now initiates a gunfight with the birds, which is another minute or so of this beautiful animation work. They drive off and encounter a tourist bus full of people. Ramsey runs out to guide them to the van, but somehow the birds are spitting acid and they all die. Rod and Natalie drive off with the kids and stop off at a gas station. I am 100% certain that this is actually the owner of the gas station and Nguyen walked in and was like, hey, you want to be famous? And then the guy was like, okay. And you cannot convince me otherwise. The kids go and pick out a piece of candy each, but everything must be blurred. We don't want no free advertising here. And they fill up the car for $100 a gallon. The birds start attacking while he's filling up the car, so he starts shooting at them. And I thought we had learned our lesson from Zoolander that sparks do not work well in this environment. They then find a cowboy on the side of the road. Howdy. He holds them at gunpoint for their extra tank of gas, and he backs away, not to his car, but to nowhere, and a bird comes out and cuts his throat. So they drive off without picking up their $100 tank of gas or the cowboy's gun. They're nothing if not resourceful. They stop off at a forest to have some food and water, and they're being watched by a creepy tree man. Why are you hiding in the trees? Well, this is my home. I live here. That's my house. He starts going on around about beetles eating trees and the damn global warming. He explains that birds won't come here and attack people. Conveniently, he hears a mountain lion to end that conversation. I hear a mountain lion. I gotta get back to my house. You better get to your car. Instead of inviting them to his house, where they are also safe from the birds, they all part ways. We get another montage of driving, and we happen to pass a car that has Mai and Rick inside, and they have been attacked. Mai's dying moments just seem like she's really annoyed to be woken up from a good nap. Close off that loose end. Finally, they stop off at a beach, and Ramsey's van, as well as being equipped with never-ending ammunition and guns for four people, also happens to have a portable stove and fishing rods. Oh, look, a stove. Yeah, real convenient, Rod. He somehow catches a foot-long fish with no bait on rocks in the roughest conditions I've ever seen. They cook it on the stove by putting the fish in boiling water and just mashing it up. Birds start swarming, so they run back to the van for shelter. The birds attack the car and suddenly... They're leaving! Yes, you're all safe. Everything's fine now. You can come out. We get a final 10 minute clip of them walking back down to the shore and watching the sunset. It looks like global warming miraculously sorted itself out. Unless. Hello, my name is Maddie, AKA Charles Bell. Thank you so much for making it through to the end of this video. <laughs> I was super overwhelmed with the response to my first video. So thank you to anyone that commented and subscribed. I really appreciate the feedback and support from you guys. If you'd like to see more from me, please like and subscribe and feel free to leave any suggestions down below on things that you'd like to see me make. This video was actually suggested on my last one. So thank you, Arthur. <laughs> I am live on Twitch on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays if you want to come and hang out there. Otherwise, I'll see you in the next one. Bye!